This video is brought to you by patreon.com slash worst take. Get access to exclusive live streams and Discord servers, on-screen shout outs, and early access to some videos when you join now. Help make sure that we can continue to make content like this by supporting the Patreon. Links are in the description down below. Always a fun time when I get to have Jake Burns on. Jake Burns, how's it been? You know, I've seen you started a new website. You know, you've been doing this new thing. Tell people about what you've been doing before we really get into this, man. Yeah, so I uh, wanted to try the entrepreneurial bug, man, of launching my own website. Got got some nice people to to come in and back the idea of building it around the uh, film breakdown podcast I've had for years. So pretty much building out a website for film lovers, Browns, X's and O's gurus who want to learn all about how the team's functioning, operating the technical side of things, right? Like what, what schemes are called, how it works, how it meshes. And then obviously doing the fun film breakdown stuff, but, but some more traditional website things to write ups, forums, things like that. Simply just Browns film breakdown.com. It'll be up and, couple of weeks i think we're aiming for like the 22nd area right around training camp because it's close man you know we're we're on the cusp but yeah it's uh an exciting exciting endeavor and like i said if you if your listeners love film breakdown content they can find some some good stuff over there with uh us to supplement what you're putting out too quincy so thanks for mm -hmm. the plug man oh yeah no problem and you know when it comes to the off season the, the second we get to July, it finally feels like it's going to be over because the offseason feels so long, especially once you get to this May, June, July, spring portion of it. One of the things that we kind of both, I don't know if we kind of like independently came to this conclusion. We're like, man, we need to rewatch the season. Um, and both of us were able to rewatch the season. And what I got through past week i'm at week 12 now with the denver game um and you got through all the sean watson games it's interesting when you rewatch a season how much context and, and just like small bits of information you realize that kind of went away after a while like oh i thought oh obo okaronkwo did really well at this facet of the game versus this opponent and that was like very encouraging or something like it's always like smaller things that kind of pop out to me at least in my experience with these um rewatches what was your experience with the rewatch especially focusing it on deshaun watson yeah i, th I think it's like um with with watson it's just trying to, to peel back like people hold on to certain uh, high and low points and it's like everybody can kind of forget what's in the middle of all that in terms of like just down to down quarterback play obviously what we focus on or what a lot of the metrics people focus on is big time throws and turnover worthy plays and those like drive so much of the conversation in the off season of of who's who mm -hmm. and where do they rank and all that all that stuff that i understand why people do it um but but really for me like what i wanted to do was put together an idea of what like down to down quarterback play looks like for him and if there's a version of that that was obviously successful last year and what that version can look like this year and where it kind of filters in why people have the opinion they do so yeah i mean there are examples of this all over the place like with the colts game i i you know thought he was maybe out there two series now he played four series in that game like things kind of moved quickly and then yeah there are some throws and i thought that happened early in the game now that happened a little later like i'm not watching both sides of the ball right now just really wanted to focus on those those five watson games and excluding the colts game because i just didn't think he was ready to play in that one uh, and it was just kind of obvious that they didn't they didn't they weren't all on the same page but yeah you know you go back you rewatch, you, you have an idea of what you try to remember but how busy we get as adults, man, like mm -hmm. eight months ago football. It's like, oh, yeah, I, I kind of remember that. I vaguely remember that. Oh, that was way. Well, you spend so much time talking about yeah. it, right? right? That the right. discussion of the football is so much more recent than your watch of the game that the discussion right. becomes reality. And we know whenever you're just having a conversation, things slip in there that maybe right. should, maybe shouldn't. Maybe you're editorializing in your own head. The thing that I saw interesting, I had to go back and talk to people who covered him in Houston, because when we talk about Deshaun Watson, we talk about Houston kind of as if that's the 
the goal, the goal to get to, right? To get Deshaun Watson back to where he was in Houston. Um, and we kind of like say things like, oh, it's Deshaun Watson offense and what they ran in Houston. When I talk to people in Houston, they say one of the biggest issues they had with Bill O'Brien and, and Tim Kelly was that they did not really attempt to build around Deshaun in the way that they wanted, you know, expected for a quarterback that put up the kind of numbers that he did early on in his career. And also another thing that I got, because I was watching these games, I'm like, man, he seems like a slow starter in the first quarter. Like, not every game, but there are times where it's like, like you just watch him in the first quarter and then you watch him in the fourth quarter. It looks like two different quarterbacks at times. And I was wondering, like, if that was something that's common and that's something that pops up with him every once in a while. And I think it's important, like yeah. you said it with day-to-day quarterback play, just to know what this guy is, because we don't know. What this dude, because we every time we see him, it's either like off of a long hiatus or he's coming back from an injury. Like we haven't been able to see him just play like eight regular games in a row. So we don't even have a good feel for what Deshaun Watson's regular rhythm is like in a game. So yeah. everything that we see, if he starts off slow in the first quarter, we're like, oh, is it rust? It, yeah. it, 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 did he forget how to play football? And it's just getting a feel for who this dude is and how he plays the position of quarterback and what kind of rhythm he is, he gets into. What kind of feel did you get for that during your rewatch uh, of what it is that you can just kind of expect, even if it's a like a regular bone average Deshaun Watson start, what do you expect that to look like? Right. I, I think kind of tracing a little bit of what you said there is s- sort of on the edge of how you have to remember this experience, which is – with Deshaun in Cleveland, uh, they didn't get, you haven't, he's been around for two years and obviously the weight of like how he arrived, the circumstances by which he arrived and all of the baggage that he carries. So, you know, whatever your opinion of that is, is your opinion, but like there is baggage there. And like, it feels like we've gone through like five years with Deshaun Watson where really it's been two and isolated inside two is like these small stretches of games, obviously six games in a season and the last third of the season is so hard to like judge him by because that offense was curtailed to like how they were finding success with Jacoby Brissett that first year. And like, it just never really felt like they were adapting. They were like, Deshaun, you come in and fit in and just try to do your best to navigate us the rest of the way. So then you get to this past season and then you get like three games into the year, you get this rainy, disgusting first game. You get a Monday night in Pittsburgh where some weird stuff happens. We'll talk about that game a bit more in depth, but like some weird stuff happens in terms of like his face mask penalties and Nick Chubb's knee blowout. Like, and then, but all of a sudden you get this third game. It's like, okay, a little normal weather, good environment in Cleveland. He plays really well. And then he's, he's clearly hurt. Like it, it happens there at some point. And then you see a couple games later in the year, but that's it. So it's like a reminder of, we have, feel like we've seen a lot, but we haven't seen enough. We haven't, we haven't mm-hmm. seen a lot at all. We haven't even seen like a third of what you would want to see from him. So you're talking about eight games. Yeah. I mean like getting him to eight straight games would be an awesome achievement. So that's a, that's like the underlying tone, like the the whole thing that we did on the podcast is like you can break down Deshaun the quarterback and we do that and we scouting report it and that's fine. But then there's this element of like uh, the, the the sort of elephant in the room, I guess, per se, which is like, can he stay healthy? And, and, and how he plays kind of like tying into him, keeping himself healthy because you can kind of trick yourself, Quincy, and tell yourself like this guy's injury prone, but he really has never been injury prone before mm-hmm. this past season, you know, he played, he would have played a full season in 22 if he didn't get suspended. Like that's, so that kind of tricks your brain. But like, I do see some stuff that makes you concerned about keeping a rare shoulder injury really healthy. Again, we'll talk about it, but, but um, when he can, like when he's playing, there's good enough stuff there to see a path to being the Houston version of himself, which is a really good quarterback like they need him to be a really good quarterback i think there's the sentiment out there that like hey if he's just average they'll be okay no i think you look at that schedule this year and he can't just be average and they'll be okay like he needs to be good he needs to be good maybe not elite here but he needs to be good he needs to be a epa contributing factor for them to be a a real playoff team and a real super bowl threat so like 
I again, I I think that you go into this idea of of rewatching his games, and you have a lot of folks who cover the league, you know, from a thirty two team perspective, who have this pretty stern opinion that he's never going to be who he used to be, and, and that last year was awful. And I didn't leave thinking last year was awful. So that's kind of where I'll I'll kind of pass it back to you. But like, I do think that there was enough in those games that made me feel encouraged that he can he can be a really good quarterback again. Yeah, it, it's one of those things with Deshaun Watson, too, where the public sentiment is what it is about him, and it's not necessarily 100% to do with what he does on the football field. So it's like, it, it's hard to give criticisms of what he did on the field or kind of just talk about what happened on the field because so many people want that season to kind of be as awful as they want it to kind of fit some some narratives that they have. But there are things to criticize in that season, right? Like, I don't think he did a good enough job kind of hitting his layups at times. Like, there were just some routine passes that he seemed to, like, short on. Like, it felt like a player who'd been practicing a lot at times. Like, you look at the one pick six, was it on stick? The one that we, we got in a whole Twitter argument with that one guy about uh, uh, yeah. in the Pittsburgh game and in a similar yeah. situation happens in the Baltimore game. Like, there are times where it's like, oh, this looks like a guy who's used to practicing. Um, and then there are other times where, like, I think in the fourth quarter, he kind of shined his best in every game that he played where you look at it and his best work, his best throw, you know, we're in the fourth quarter. And he had narratives out like, oh, he didn't, he was dragged to the victory line. And that's just not the impression I got from watching those games as a quarterback who was dragged across the line there. Um, there there's some interesting games to talk about. We don't have the most time in the world. When you look at this, and again, it's six games, and you made the great point that like he missed all those games the first season because of a suspension, not necessarily because of an injury. It's just hard to judge what his availability has meant over the last two years. But how much do you put into the fact that he plays three games, he goes out for like two, three weeks, tries to come back, obviously not ready, comes back tonight, like the constant returning that he had to do, and yeah. the the. the third quarterback at that point too so like the wide receiver is going to be affected by the time he gets back for the baltimore game jack conklin and uh what dewan jones was in and out the lineup in that baltimore game i believe and then uh jed wills was out by the baltimore game as well like how much of that kind of really affects how you view this when when you're evaluating him just the injuries that happen around him and what do you think if he did stay healthy through that year we would be talking about yeah, it's it's hard because it's the third game that he takes that pop on the shoulder. And, like, you know, he finishes clearly, the game. And it, it, yeah. clear, it was a bad – he delivered the brunt of the hit. Like, if you go back and watch it, I think, mm -hmm. like, you were talking earlier about perception versus reality and what you remember. Like, I remember him getting hit. No, he delivered the hit. It was a big hit. And I think and the safety was caught by surprise on that – play exactly go ahead earlier in that game i think there's a roughing call on him and if you watch yeah. how his shoulder lands on that roughing call too yeah, it kind yeah, of like Danico cracks Autry up, got up against his yeah, yeah autry got up and, under his face mask and landed like may he landed awkward but that's kind of a theme which we we, yeah. we need to talk about but like um no so like again three games in your shoulder gets hurt pretty bad you can finish that game there was never really a challenging throw after that run so you're like talking about um, a throw up the, you know, to Amari Cooper down the field when no one covered him late. So like, yeah, it was a 40 yard throw, but he's wide open. So it's not like an overly challenging throw per se. But like, I think what you have to do is understand that after that third game, after I think again, the Pittsburgh game, rewatching it, obviously there was a fumble. Obviously there was some other stuff that came in that game that wasn't great for him. But from a down to down perspective, I didn't think he was bad in the Pittsburgh game. I actually thought he put together some pretty competent throws in that game so like i was encouraged after rewatching that one a little more than what i thought i would be he made some really nice sideline throws but like um you know personally for me how i would view it is I, as a quarterback if you take this if he has this really gnarly shoulder injury that they, they're they're really misdiagnosing throughout the year it ends yeah. up being this very rare injury more popular in baseball and volleyball players so like you know, Quincy, as a quarterback, you need to throw during the week. And if you're compensating for how you're throwing all the time and trying to rework like, you know, hey, if I do X, Y and Z, then it doesn't lead to as much pain or discomfort, whatever, whatever. I just think that there's like to me. 
it's hard to be consistent down to down game to game when you're trying to just navigate how to throw like like I'm not talking your left shoulder it's your right shoulder and it's a weird injury they're misdiagnosing it throughout the year I think that's abundantly clear so like you're talking about all those other elements the tackles missing timing etc yeah that's true but like he wasn't throwing enough in practice to be true. even close to consistent enough in games so like what he was able to do after the debacle in Indianapolis and like taking some time off and then what he was able to put together in Arizona and then ultimately into the second half of that Baltimore game, which again, the first half was six for 20, but it wasn't as bad as that. Those numbers tell you, in my opinion, it's not like he was missing a bunch of options. I think that no, no, we don't need to dig too deep into that, but like that Baltimore game was obviously the second half. It's a tale of two halves in terms of like perception. People think the second half was like, it was 14 to 14 and that's great, but he just took like, there's he this idea there. I have that he had an epiphany about playing mm -hmm. the game. We're like, hey, man, I got to stop doing the hero ball stuff all the time. Like, I don't have to make a 70-yard a throw to regain my reputation. Like, it's, it's mm -hmm. like when things go bad for you, it's like a baseball player or in a slump or whatever. Like, you think you have to do one thing that brings everything back for you. And it's like if you can just clear your mind. And I know Deshaun has talked a lot about this in the offseason. And just just process and, and 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 take advantage of what teams give you, it'll give you a better chance to find down to down success. And it was the the biggest reason it was so heartbreaking with last year's team was like, okay, that started to click in the Baltimore game for him a little bit. You started to feel it the way defenses are defending this offense. And okay, everything's there. Come back win, and then all of a sudden he's done for the year. So like that was why it was so deflating because you could start to see that click. But again, a reminder like five games in the first like 10 weeks still is that's not enough to know for sure so you're just really trying to parse out like is this as bad as it on the surface people tell you it is because they just look at the baseline data or is it or is there something inside these five games that gives you cur like encouragement and i felt and i know my co-host on the show who's a little more down on watson left it feeling more encouraged as well that he can do this but we have to talk about how he plays because how he plays matters most because like mm -hmm. he's dealing with a very like go look at what happened to Cam Newton's shoulder and it's not the same injury but like Cam pre and post shoulder injury is a different football player and I think Deshaun can come back from this injury but it is a unique and different injury and he has to protect it man like if he doesn't protect it it's dicey and it can happen to him again yeah and I think the one saving grace for him is that ultimately when I look at Cam Newton, when I look at Deshaun Watson, I see two different types of quarter. Well, not types of quarterback. They're similar in what they can offer. But I mean, Cam was much more like he won't, he took what number two in rushing attempts for Carolina for a very long time. He was very much their fourth and short option for the longest time. I mean, the Browns don't even like to sneak with Deshaun Watson um, for whatever reason there, right? Like they always send in Harrison Bryant or whoever they're going to send in this year, Jordan Atkins, uh, yeah, to yeah. do those kind of things. What what do you think that, that plan looks like to kind of keep Watson safe? Because some of this stuff, when I look at it, it's not that he's running exclusively. It's not that he's taking the hits. It's the position he puts himself in and the position that he puts himself in to get hit by the specific people that's hitting him. Because it's like, if this were DBs that were hitting him, like smaller guys, out of bounds, kind of like, you know, the sideline type hits, I don't think that bothers us as much, but it's like he's cutting upfield into the center of it and he's getting hit by number 54, number 52, yeah. number 91, right? Like yeah. those are the hits that he has to figure out how he can avoid taking. And some of that is, I don't know how he can avoid it because how he plays football is he's kind of relentless on like not being taken down, which means you're going to be in a bad spot to get knocked out or, 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 or hit pretty hard there. And it's like, what does he have to just learn to just throw it out of bounds? Like, does he have to kind of change how, like how does he retain his identity and what he brings to the table as this guy who can make something happen out of nothing while also doing that on a safe level? Like, I, how does he figure that one out? Or does that element of his game has to go kind of like it went for Ben Roethlisberger? I, th I think that question is probably the first thing that they all wrote on the big board in Berea for the offseason, for him. Like, sit down, position, mm -hmm. review. And like, 
you know, there are parts of Watson's game. I think he he was a little too reliant on the sideline. I think he could have worked. There's some like he needs to work the middle of the field more. Um, there's some stuff with like intermediate accuracy. I'd like to see improve and like some of the like you mentioned earlier layup throws. Like the micro accuracy needs to be a little bit better. But like on the field down to down, I'm fine with him. I think he can be fine. If the offense is kind of structured a little differently, which I think it will, I think it lends a little bit more to how he's tempo wise ready to play and how he's ready to throw. And like, I don't have a problem with it. the thing that we came back to. And like, I, again, from a quarterback perspective, I think he can be a top 10 guy again. But what you come back to is like down to down decision making with his body. Like, and again, this is not an injury prone guy. I know he's had a couple ACL, so it's you're, you're kind of walking a, a, t- a tightrope here. But his NFL career has not been beat up that bad. So, like and when we say injury prone, you're talking about guys who miss like three weeks with like a hamstring sure. and like the, it's sure. like in and out the lineup because like it, not a ton of people are like oh they miss they have season ending injuries. It's not usually what we go in to like yeah. for example a great M- Maurice Hurst with like tearing one of his pecs like that happens almost every right. year with him. Um, but yeah, I just I just bad. want to be careful to say that he's not injury prone. Like, yeah. I don't think that's been a huge like his rookie year. I think he had the ACL, but like since then, it was pretty good for him. So, mm-hmm. and and again, I think we trick our brain into thinking he missed with injury time his first year in Cleveland, and that's not the case. So, it like, kind of all lumps together. But like, last year was kind of eye opening in terms of like the Tennessee hit was whatever. So it was quarterback power. The Browns won't be running any quarterback power type stuff anymore. I don't see them having those interior packages for quarterback play. If you pin pull, put them on the sideline, that could happen. We'll see. But like that's not it's pretty clear. Your huge investment, you don't want to risk it anymore. So um but what I am concerned about like tracking the Cincinnati game, which he took a ton of unnecessary hits in that game. He took a ton of unnecessary hits um I think in the Cardinals game. Like the Cardinals game was why he had this, 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 let me be careful here. I think somebody tweeted two weeks ago that like, this is what the Browns thought they were getting with Watson. And this is what they did. Like, this is what they (laughs) thought they were getting. And it was like a video of him making a bunch of hero plays with the Texans. And if you go watch him last year, he is still making the first man miss all the time. Like if Mm -hmm. somebody is coming free, either coming free because of a line twist and they don't pick it up right or a free blitzer because they don't slide right or they just six on five them and whatever, they get a guy free. He was like 90% of the time making the first man miss. That is a rare skill. That is something that is defined to Sean since his Georgia, his Atlanta, I think he was Atlanta guy, high school days. Like that was a yeah. huge part of his, his yeah, whole thing was like he can make people miss and make those unbelievable out of structure plays. He's still able to do that within the confines of the pocket. The problem is what he does when he gets out of there. Like if you go watch the Arizona game, you reference this, he escapes the pocket on one throw. I think it's early second half and decides instead of cutting, like pushing toward the sideline, hanging on to see if somebody comes open and then chucking it out of bounds or running out, he cuts up field back against the grain and a defensive tackle behind him ear holes him and it is the worst hit he took all year like Mm -hmm. maybe other than the Colts hit that he took when his arm was up in the air that ultimately kicked him out of that game it's right there it was awful and it's a 300 pound dude and like obviously he took hits in the Baltimore game too so like he has to do something whatever it is like the mental part for him of, of I don't want him to not be a guy that can't make out of structure plays. We want that. That makes him him. He's talked mm-hmm. about it. It's all over his scouting report. When I write it up, like that's still there. He can still drive the football. Even when he took those hits, he would come out and drive the ball to the, to the hash opposite hash sideline. Fine. He can still do it. The deep ball accuracy was pretty good outside of the Cincy game, but the Cincy game was off weather. So like, you're taking that with mm-hmm. a very big caveat, but like, he can do these things still, but he has to protect himself. Like, okay, man, I'm out of the pocket. Nothing's open. Throw it away. Okay, man, I'm out of the pocket. I'm scrambling. I don't have to reach, extend, and throw myself forward to get two more yards. When like that first down doesn't make the year, my man. Like, obviously, there are yeah. big moments in the fourth quarter. It's tied. You got to do it. You got to do it. That's different. But in a Cardinals game where you're up 17 nothing, they have Clayton Tune. They can't do anything on offense. You don't have to do that. Like he has yeah. to has to click for him. He's not twenty three. He's going to be twenty nine this year, pushing thirty. He cannot and play this way anymore, man. He can't. Like part of it, it, it to me feels like with Deshaun, he spent so much time 
being the main thing yeah. in whatever offense he is. Like, obviously, high school, he's the shot wise. He's going to be the main thing. And Clemson, he goes to Clemson, he's the main thing, right? That's what kind of took Clemson to that second tier of college football program was his success there. Before they were a good program, Todd Boyd, good wide receivers, but that took yeah. Debo to another level there, right? And then he gets to the NFL, Texans, not a great team around him. Like, they put together some solid pieces, but it was kind of all him. Now, and like he talks about this, but I wonder, like, it's one thing to talk about this, but for it to click mentally when you're going at full game speed, because I see a dude who feels like maybe for his reputation, maybe to win the game, like his instincts are, I need to do it. Like, I yeah. need to be the one to do, do it. But you're going to have Nick Chubb eventually at some point during this year, right? You're going to have. Um, Amari Cooper to lean on. You're going to have these, uh, David and Joku. It's a great, just, okay, it's, throw five yards to David, see what happens, right? Like you have right. these things built in so you don't have to do this. And you're not, like you mentioned, he's not 23. His body is not made out of rubber anymore. It's made out of bones and, and regular human meat like everybody right. else. So, and it's like, he just needs to have that in him where it's like, maybe there's like a quarter, a quarter of a second. He needs to take off that timer of, when it's valid to try to make a play, right? And right. maybe he figures that out. Maybe he doesn't. Those are the things that's just super hard to predict, right? Because it's like well, it's just, it's I just don't quarterback know what goes DNA. Into that. Yeah. yeah, it's hard. It's hard to rewrite your DNA as a football player. And I don't want him to become check down, a check down yeah. menace. Like we don't. No one wants that. I do want him getting out of the pocket. I do want him making the first guy miss. I do want him extending plays. I think that it's important to remember that like scrambling success driven data is very capricious um and what i mean by that is like i think people who do a good job of tracking football metrics will will, will um identify this and this was something that happened with like baker's first year but like um year to year carryover of success and scramble situations is not in it's just not consistent because there's too many um wild factors that go on mm -hmm. there that you, like uh, in pocket metrics year to year handle themselves better they usually stay very consistent but like outside of the pocket it's just it's hard like a guy didn't see you and didn't break out and like you know or db you started to run forward instead of staying back etc cetera, etc cetera. there's a lot of stuff there but like last year's scramble stuff wasn't great just it just is what it is in terms of like they didn't get many good results from it but i still want him doing that he needs to get out of place he needs to use that god-given ability but what has to happen for him and what i think takes to sean from this quincy a fork in the road which is like He's either going to be a 32-year-old after this Browns contract who can't play anywhere. He gets a one-year deal with someone, and then he's out. Like Cam, mm -hmm. no offense. Or he's playing to 35, Carson to 36, Hicks. 37, is that he can identify those moments and situations where he's like, I don't need to fight for this yard, these yards, this moment, this throw. Hold on to it just a split second longer so I can get somebody to hit me up under my right armpit when I'm throwing the ball. But it's a, it's a, it's like a – slim probability play like his mental ability to figure that out is how he's either playing eight more nfl seasons or like four because if mm -hmm. he doesn't solve it i'm not saying something's going to happen next year but i am saying that like this compound hit 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 stuff is going to linger into his 30s and that's where like we're at the point right now where this is year three in his browns contract they haven't restructured it yet there's a way to get out of it with a chunky cap hit after the fourth year like the Browns are at a crossroads, again, kind of working themselves back to where Mayfield was, where you're like, we want to see more data about Baker before we give him another contract. The Browns are like, we need to see Deshaun play a full season before we start, decide to restructure this again and decide that, like, I mean, like, do we want it? Like, the whole thing about his contract was we can keep restructuring it so that we, when we give him another extension for five more years, we're in a good place. Well, they're at the point now where like they got to make that decision about that extension in the next mm -hmm. few years and they don't have enough. So like he just I believe kind of putting a cap on this, he can be a top 10 quarterback if he does if he stays within the confines of an offense and keeping his body right. Accentuate what you're good at. Find those moments to get out of the pocket chaos and make those hero plays. 
but get better at identifying when you're putting yourself in a real risk factor and throwing it away, living another down, or living another series of like, hey, man, yeah, we came up short, third and two, whatever, we didn't get it, but we'll come back. You're still playing, man. They need you, and you have mm -hmm. a fourth down aggressive coach who will push the envelope on those fourth and shorts anyway. So stop yep. feeling like you have to put yourself in like the most serious harm's way to pick up yards that ultimately don't mean anything, but that is hard. Rewriting how you play mentally in those moments where, you know, Quincy, when you're playing ball, like it's just react, react, react. You're not thinking, mm -hmm. like, you don't get out of the pocket and think to yourself, oh God, well, calculating this decision is 57% likely to make, nah, man, you're going to do what you got to do, but he's got to <laughs> just a lot get of <laughs> better. It's, it's just a lot of, oh shit, shit, shit. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It is so reaction based. So I don't have the answer. He works with mm -hmm. Quincy Avery, his quarterback coach, and maybe he needs a mental coach to work on this, but like he needs to get better at identifying moments where he can help himself stay healthy by just living to fight another down. If that's dumping it down to David instead of having to deal with like, oh, I got to make this DB miss on this Ed, this nickel blitz. No, just dump it off to David. Let him create 15 yards. He's the best run after catch player in the league. And the Browns hopefully will bake in more of these answers for him and get him used to finding these answers. But like the crux of all of this is can he stay healthy? Can he consistently stay healthy? Because if mm -hmm. he does, what I have watched, consumed, and believe – is that if he's out there getting the reps, playing the games, getting his feet wet again, and doing it consistently, he can be a top ten guy again. He can. And I, I think I wonder how much that twenty twenty season like traumatized him as far as like how he plays because that defense was so bad. Like I read off the numbers, basically anybody playing against the Texas defense would have had a Hall of Fame year running or mm -hmm. passing the ball. It was such a bad defense, and it's like the other thing to add on top of everything you said. You have an aggressive coach. You're in a great situation to where you don't have to do it all. You also got the best defense in the world behind you. Right. So right. you know, you you can go you can you can go dry for a quarter, maybe six, like maybe a quarter and a half, and it might be fine. Like there's a good chance yeah. it's going to be fine, depending on who you play. That you don't have to do it all. And I think maybe the experience of him watching these other quarterbacks beat San Francisco, win these games, get to the playoffs, right? Him knowing that the, the level of quarterback play might not be what he could provide, but knowing that they were able to do that, maybe it clicks something. Watching Pat Mahomes this year, right? Pat Mahomes yeah. really leaned on that defense to get to where he is. And even like the stuff with Joe Burrow, I know people make it like magic Joe Burrow, but a lot of that stuff, the first couple of years they made that run with Cincinnati was a lot about it's what that defense simple, was able yeah. to do. And, 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 and it's and like simple plays, simple yeah. plays. And I think maybe something clicked with him, or I, I hope something clicked with him during this offseason while he was rehabbing from that shoulder injury that, like, made him realize the pressure isn't, like, he has to play well. We all know that, right? Mm -hmm. Just so we can stop talking about it, but also so the team can be wherever they want to be. But he has to play well. There's pressure on him. But it's not, we need you to uplift this team that could maybe win five games, um, to being a playoff threat. Like this team was able to get 11, what they got four with them. So they got what, seven of those games without him. They were able to get there. They were a successful team. They're, they have that there for you. And it's about just taking that. And maybe that's the big key to this development, right? Cam kept being put in situations late in his career after that shoulder injury where he had to be the guy. And not just be the guy. That's why I'm worried about Josh Allen, right? You look at that situation in Buffalo, and you're like, wow, he plays in that way. He's super young right now. But they're edging more and more to this Josh Allen kind of has to do it all philosophy. And that's cool when he's 23, 24, 25, 26. But when he starts turning 28, those hits start to actually hurt. And right. then you get to stuff like this. And I think for Deshaun, it's that's, it's, if it's, it's going to happen, it's got to happen here. It's important to remember too, like you referenced some running quarterbacks like Mahomes and I think Mahomes and, and, and Lamar Jackson are fun ones to talk about because like Lamar runs designed run plays all the time. Like we've mm -hmm. seen it, right? He's, he's a leading volume guy doing that stuff. A little less last year than years prior because of Greg Roman, but like Lamar doesn't get squared up. Like he does watch them play. Nobody squares that. He has an uncanny ability to very rarely take this this, this like very impactful hit. Now, Lamar's had the soft tissue injury issues, but he's never like, oh, he got hit, and that's what caused it. It's very rare. It's the same mm -hmm. with Mahomes. He's always kind of doing this, like, 
like this weird trot and this half, like, is he going to slide? Is he not going to slide? Nobody ever hits him. Deshaun Watson is like a, like a, like a, like a tackle dummy. People just light him up. He does not you have know, it, it, Remember Trent his, Richardson? A hundred percent. Where it's yes. like, where Mike Tomlin had that quote. He's like, he's not great at delivering punishment, but he's great yes. at taking it. And sometimes you yes. feel that way about the shot. It's like, boy, he takes a lot of punishment. That's exactly right. And that's like, he doesn't have that just little part of his game mm -hmm. and and people square him up and they really deliver and they're looking to like i do think that defenses are like we light this guy up he's not going to want to keep doing it. like they're they're going after him there's no like sometimes i feel like with mahomes it's like people are like ah you know let's respect him we don't want to get him like because i know antonio pierce has come into to vegas and been like nah we're gonna we're gonna light this guy up if he runs a whole thing but like also he, it's pat too you're worried about getting like the, the frivolous kind of roughing the passer right. stuff. Exactly, exactly. And just yeah. Deshaun just doesn't have that. So he yeah. has to he has to take onus of that, ownership of it, and like really make sure he's protecting himself because nobody else is going to do that. So I hope I hope I genuinely think that the way I've come to believe on this is like he can either play four years and figure it out on another team after this because he can't protect himself, or he can be another eight to ten because he figures mm -hmm. it out. He gets rid of the football. He lets his guys work for him, and he, he, he like manages enough, but then is able to hero ball the big moments when he needs to because that's still there. Basically, like you know, Baltimore game, right? You know, take yeah. what's there, and then that last drive. Okay, yeah, run that ball for twenty yards, get it in the field yes. goal, goal range, right? Yeah. Like take that. That hits fine, right? On the sideline, okay, whatever, right? Right. Those. That's that's basically what you need him to do, right? Don't take away everything you have to your game. Um, just kind of be try to be a little bit more mindful of it which is I mean, it's tough as hell to ask but we'll see yeah. if and i will the last thing i'll say is if there's a situation where he's in a position to learn it and this is wild to say this given what the browns history is it's in cleveland like there's no better situation for him to figure this out than cleveland because the support around you is a big part of it right so maybe that ends up being the case for him but jake Always a good time having you on. Thank you for, for jumping on, giving me the time. You have a great day. Everybody else have a great day. Peace. Demo. 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 Demo.